the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your mostly bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal. I'm your host, John Ross, joined by Sheldon Gilbert, the director of IJ Center for Judicial Engagement, as well as special guest, Clark Neely. Clark is a founding member of this show who is now the vice president for criminal justice at the Cato Institute. Clark, welcome back. It's great to be back. Thank you. The issue of qualified immunity comes up often in Clark's work, and that's what we'll be discussing today. Let's start things off with a quick intro to qualified immunity, Clark. So qualified immunity is a doctrine that the Supreme Court invented out of whole cloth in uh, 1982 to make it very difficult uh, for citizens to sue public officials, including particularly police officers, for misconduct. Essentially what the qualified immunity doctrine says is that contrary to the language of uh, 42 U.S.C. section 1983 – which gives people a statutory right to sue state actors who violate their rights. Um, Contrary to that statutory language, uh, if you're suing a public official, including a police officer, you actually have to show that the right in question was, quote unquote, clearly established. Uh, And that term essentially has come to mean that every reasonable police officer would know beyond any doubt that the conduct they engaged in was unconstitutional. And in effect, in practice, what it means uh, is that you can only sue police officers who essentially um, intentionally violate your rights knowing that they're doing so or are incompetent beyond imagination, just completely incompetent. And it makes it very difficult. It, it serves as a very effective bar to preventing people who have suffered uh, injuries from the misconduct of police officers from holding them civilly liable. And that's its function. Isn't it a little odd that in criminal law, we basically presume that every individual knows the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of criminal laws that are out there. We presume that they know it, and that's why ignorance is no excuse for the law, right? Um, But with qualified immunity, there's basically a presumption that the police officers who are charged with enforcing the laws don't know what the Constitution tells them that they can or can't do. Doesn't that just flip things on its head? It's a great point. And I think whether it seems odd depends on how much you know about constitutional and criminal law. Um, If you're sort of a naive person who thinks that the law should be fairly consistent, it would seem odd. If you know a lot about criminal law and constitutional law, what you know is that it's absolutely jam-packed with double standards um, that hold citizens to one standard and public officials to a much different and usually much more lenient standard. So yes, it's weird. um, And and I would say... um, unjustifiable, but it is a perfectly routine feature of uh, of this area of the law, by which I mean, again, courts uh, inventing double standards so that government uh, agents are held to a lower, more favorable standard than citizens. Very common. Now, you said that the, the first question that courts ask in deciding whether or not uh, officers are immune is whether or not every reasonable police officer would know with kind of without a shadow of a doubt that what they were doing violated the Constitution. How do courts decide that? How do they decide whether or not every reasonable officer, you know, would know something? Uh, In a word, in a very inconsistent way. Uh, There's all kinds of different formulations of the qualified immunity test. It's very difficult to reconcile them. Uh, But what emerges is essentially an attempt by the courts to Um, uh, place themselves in the shoes of a quote-unquote reasonable police officer who is well-read in the precedence of that jurisdiction and just ask, you know, knowing those cases, would you or would you not understand that the thing that you're about to do, whether it's shooting a fleeing suspect or, as we will get to later, uh, taking someone into custody who hasn't done anything wrong but was just present when a crime was committed because you want to question them, would you know that that is absolutely forbidden? And one of the most challenging questions in this area is just how on point does the prior case law have to be? Uh, And you'll see a huge range um, uh, of of, uh, approaches that the courts take to that. Sometimes they'll say, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly on point. If it kind of puts you on notice, that's enough. And in other cases, they'll say practically it has to be virtually an identical set of facts or there's no way that cop could have known that he shouldn't have done that thing, notwithstanding the point the Supreme Court has disclaimed that level of specificity. Some uh, lower courts tend to apply qualified immunity in, pre- in precisely that way. Now, it seems to me that, uh, and I think this is pretty well established, that any time uh, there's very broad discretion for a government actor or, or in this case for, for judges, um, to to determine whether or not something is is uh, reasonably established for every officer, 
that you then open the door to all sorts of strategic behavior by judges, right? And this reminds me of the Law Review article by Chris Walker and Aaron Nielsen, where they do this empirical study of something like 800 qualified immunity decisions. And they find this really interesting pattern that if you have an all Republican panel of judges at the circuit courts, then they find that the law is not clearly established and therefore there's qualified immunity. If you have an all Democrat panel, uh, more often than not, they find that the law is clearly established and therefore there is no qualified immunity. And when you have mixed panels, you get kind of mixed results, right? Um, and and that, that seems troubling that you would get radically different types of outcomes based on the type of judges that you, that you happen to draw. I think that's right. I, I, and I would add two points. Uh, the first point is that the um, room to work, so to speak, in this area is so broad that I would say that it's more often the case that you can plausibly reach any result you want in a qualified immunity case. In other words, whether to apply it or not apply it. Um, so you can, you can and more often than not, you can reach any result you want. There are probably a minority of cases where the the correct outcome is pretty clearly determined. Um, the other thing that's really important to know about this is the subtext. In other words, the contextual um, environment in which these cases are decided. And the most important feature of that environment is the fact that the Supreme Court is very, very aggressive about granting cert in qualified immunity cases, but not across the board. They grant cert when qualified immunity has been withheld. And it's one of two areas of law, the other one being habeas corpus, where uh, the Supreme Court is almost certain to get involved. They pounce in a heartbeat if they see qualified immunity withheld in a, a civil rights case. Um, and almost always they jump in in order to reverse the decision uh, and instruct the lower court that they should apply qualified immunity in, in order to let the officer off the hook. And the Supreme Court, as I said, is extremely inclined and very, very um, consistently jumps into these cases in order to shield police officers from liability. Okay, well, that's a perfect segue to our first case, which comes out of the Tenth Circuit. Clark? So this is a case we've covered once before on Short Circuit. Um, it's returned now to the Tenth Circuit. Case is called Polly v. White. Um, quick summary: uh, Three officers responded to a report of possible road rage on a highway in New Mexico. By the time they arrived, the driver in question uh, had returned to his house a little ways away. It was on top of a hill in a wooded area. Um, the police officers identified the the complaining witnesses. Uh, and determined that you know, this guy has driven off to his house. It's late at night. It's raining. There is no urgency. There are no exigent circumstances. There is no reason whatsoever why they should go to that house in the middle of the night instead of just noting the address and returning uh, to talk to the, the, the possible um, perpetrator the next day. But for whatever reason, they decide that they are going to um, um, go and try and talk to him in the middle of the night, uh, in the middle of a rainy night. And what happens is three police officers approach the house. There's some dispute about whether they sufficiently identify themselves as police officers. There are two brothers in the house. Um, one of them dies and one of them survives. The surviving brother says they were absolutely terrified because they saw these people uh, moving around out in the, essentially out in the bushes and not identifying themselves. So they armed themselves and said, get away. Um, and that's when things get really murky about who said what and, and who did what. But what isn't disputed is that eventually uh, shots were fired and one of the police officers killed one of the brothers. And then uh, the, the survivor of the remaining brother, his father, and the surviving brother brought suit against the police officers. And the gist of the case is, was that shooting justified um, or more precisely, were the officers who created a situation in which the fatal shooting occurred entitled to qualified immunity or not entitled to qualified immunity? And really it all boils down to um, should they have known that there was a clear constitutional right on the part of the brothers occupying that house not to be subjected to the conduct uh, that they experienced? In this case, um, attempting to illegally enter a house in the absence of a warrant with no exigent circumstances leading to uh, a deadly exchange of gunfire. And this isn't the first time the Tenth Circuit has taken on this case, is it? 
No. So the first time it went up to the Tenth Circuit, uh, the it's a, it was a long and fairly complicated opinion in which the court tried to sort out each officer's role uh, in the uh, the incident and determined that there would be no qualified immunity. Um, the officers then um, sought cert in the Supreme Court, which summarily reversed and sent it back to the lower courts for further proceedings. And that's the posture in which the case arrived back at the Tenth Circuit. And the second time around, the Tenth Circuit, um, it's quite a, a rather striking opinion. The Tenth Circuit goes on at some length, documenting the misconduct of the officers, demonstrating that in the initial round of the appeal, the officers' lawyers misled the court as to the factual record and one particular officer's uh, conduct in the incident, and then uh, makes very clear that there was misconduct, that the constitutional rights of these brothers were violated, and that the officers misbehaved. And then you get to the last page and it says, yeah, but they shouldn't have, uh, there's no precedent directly on point that would have told them that they couldn't approach, um, you, you know, attempt to uh, illegally enter a house in the middle of the night on a rainy night in New Mexico. So too bad qualified immunity applies. Um, as you may um, have surmised, I find it to be a very objectionable result. Clerk, you said that the Supreme Court summarily reversed the Tenth Circuit. Uh, and you also described the Tenth Circuit's original opinion as uh, as very detailed, very engaged, um, really looking carefully at the details. Um, what's the significance of the Supreme Court summarily reversing? What does that mean? Can you tell us? Yeah, so the technical term is a GVR, grant, vacate, reverse, and uh, it did so with a short opinion uh, in which, according to the Tenth Circuit, the Tenth Circuit uh, understanding of what the court, Supreme Court had done was that um, – our error, according to the Supreme Court, was, quote, we failed to identify a case where an officer acting under similar circumstances was held to have violated the Fourth Amendment. Um, I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that the panel's understanding of the Supreme Court's ruling seems to be, hey, you guys didn't identify a case where three police officers approached a house in the woods on a hill at night in the rain at 11.15 p.m. and one of them was named Officer White. And if there's no case like that on the books, <laughs> then these guys couldn't have known um, or they weren't um, you know, on notice and it wasn't clearly established that what they did was impermissible. Um, that is a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not much of an exaggeration. Okay, Sheldon, let's move on to our next case then, which comes out of the Fifth Circuit. So this is an interesting case that I think is a, is a real Christmas tragedy. It's December 26th, the day after Christmas, and uh, John Lincoln is an individual who has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and has not been taking his medication, and he gets into something of a, of a row with his father, uh, takes a, a gun from his father's house, and heads over to his mother, Kathleen Lincoln's house. Um, his father is very concerned that John might do something dangerous. And so he, he calls uh, one of his daughters, the, the sister of, uh, of John Lincoln, who happens to be a police officer, and says, hey, I think John might be dangerous. He's gone over to your mother's house, and I think that something needs to be done. Well, John gets to his mother's house, and his mother's not there. But who is there is a woman named Erin Lincoln, 18 years old, who is John's own daughter. Now, Erin is very familiar with her dad and says that, you know, she thinks she could calm him down and that there was no risk whatsoever. But the police had been called and show up outside the house. In force, multiple SWAT teams. Yes, multiple SWAT teams, right? So it's, it's not just one or two police officers. You basically have um, an entire SWAT team show up outside the front door. Uh, they call... The uh, the phone number at the house, Aaron says, Dad, don't pick up the phone. I think it'll just agitate you. Don't worry about it. Uh, he picks up the phone and gets very agitated because of the police. And he goes and opens the door <clears throat> a couple times. And, the, and Aaron is standing right next to him every time and tells the police, everything's OK. Don't worry. I'm safe. Uh, I just need to calm my dad down. Uh, and the third time that Mr. Lincoln opens the door, the police open fire and kill Mr. Lincoln. At that point, Erin Lincoln basically throws herself down on her dad's body, and she's very distraught. And the police officer, one of the police officers, uh, comes over and physically lifts her up, throws basically throws him over uh, his shoulders, throw, takes her and throws her over the, the back gate and, and throws her into the back of a car. Handcuffed. Uh, handcuffed, and, uh, and leaves her there for two hours. And so the question at this point is, whether or not that police officer violated Aaron, the daughter's constitutional rights, by doing that. Did the police officer, 
you know, unreasonably seize her? And did the police officer use excessive force? I, I have to say, I think it's astonishing that we're even having this discussion. The level of inhumanity that was shown in this case, both to the father and the daughter, um, offends me. And um, something else that really offends me about this case is in the case, there's an effort by the police to, and frankly, by their lawyers, to very obviously retroactively come up with some reason why they might have uh, handcuffed this poor, distraught 18-year-old woman who's just seen her father killed by her side. And actually, the, one of the opinions notes that the, the, the gunshots narrowly missed her. And one of the things they say is, well, maybe she was involved in some sort of a criminal enterprise involving trying to prevent her father from speaking to the police under the circumstances. That is transparently absurd. And the idea that the police officer involved um, took her into custody because he thought she might have been involved in some crime is also transparently absurd. This is a very obvious attempt to retroactively justify conduct that was both unconstitutional and inhumane. Uh, and and the court accepts it. The court accepts it. So the let's let's talk a little bit about specifically what the court does, because the court says, look, we agree with Aaron that the police uh, violated the, her Fourth Amendment rights by grabbing her and throwing her in the back of the car for two hours. We agree that they used excessive force. We agree that it was an unreasonable seizure. Uh, and and they actually reject kind of the police officer's explanations for why they did that. And they said, no, you had no justification to do that. She was – you claim that she was potentially a witness. She's not uh, really uh, being thrown into the back of the car because she committed some sort of crime. And we agree that she has pled enough to make out uh, good claims that her constitutional rights have been violated. But – and this is kind of the traditional – you know, the, the qualified immunity two-step. It's a, it's a familiar dance that we see in opinion after opinion after opinion where the court says, you're, you're right. The police really did something terrible and unconstitutional, and it's a real tragedy that this happened, you know, on Christmas Eve to this, this family and this daughter had to see, you know, her, her dad shot in front of her. It's a tragedy. But, but because of qualified immunity, we're sorry the police officers can't be held accountable. Yeah, and it's very much like the, the reasoning and the result in the case we just discussed, the one out of New Mexico. Essentially what the, well, I don't have to say essentially, here's what the court holds. None of the existing cases, none of the existing precedents clearly established that a law enforcement officer could not detain a witness to a police shooting for two hours while a SWAT team sorts out what happened at the scene. It is within a whisker again of saying, well, there's no case on point where an officer named Patrick Turner took into custody a woman named Erin Lincoln, who was 18 years old on December 26th after a SWAT team fired three shots at her father. So guess what? Qualified immunity because there's not a case on point. Again, an exaggeration, but barely an exaggeration. It is becoming virtually impossible to win these qualified immunity cases because of the way courts define what constitutes a controlling precedent. Um, I want to just add there's a, there's a kind of a, almost a, an epilogue paragraph at the end of the opinion where the court says, we note that there may be an emerging trend in other courts um, holding that it's unreasonable to det detain witnesses to police shootings uh, for an extended period of time, but that's just a trend. That's not a clear holding that a police officer would understand actually um, uh, controls his own behavior. So we can't hold them to that standard. Again, qualified immunity, let this officer off the hook. Well, the really bizarre thing to me is that part of that emerging trend is from the Fifth Circuit itself with the same plaintiff. So this decision came out, you know, uh, very recently. But back in April, another decision involving the same facts actually found that there was no qualified immunity. And let me explain what happened. So we've taken we've taken the story up to the point where Aaron Lincoln has been thrown in the back of a police car for two hours because she was the witness to a shooting. After she was put in the police car for two hours, a Texas Ranger then takes her and detains her for another five hours to interrogate her over and over and over again about exactly what happened. Meanwhile, her sister, remember, who's an, who's an Arlington County police officer. Her aunt. Is, her aunt, sorry, her aunt, who's an Arlington County police officer, is there saying, you're violating my niece's rights. You can't be doing this. She's a witness. You can't be detaining her like this. So they also brought a lawsuit challenging the Texas Rangers' uh, conduct, detaining her as a witness. And when that case reaches the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit says, well, it is 
uh, established, clearly established for every reasonable officer that you can't just detain a witness for, you know, these long periods of time for hours at a time uh, if you if you don't think that that they're part of the crime. Right. And and that's basically the exact same thing that happens when she's in the back of the car. It's just kind of a, a slight tweak in the facts and you get radically different outcomes for basically the same uh, the same constitutional violation. And it gets even worse than that, if you can imagine. So as Sheldon has mentioned, there are two cases involving the same incident. In the first one uh, that came down in April involving an officer named Barnes, the Fifth Circuit said that the police officer was not entitled to qualified immunity. Because why? Because uh, detaining a witness to a police shooting under the circumstances um, violated a clearly established right that she had. But then six months later, the same court uh, with Two new judges, two different judges, uh, holds that, in fact, an officer who engaged in very similar conduct was entitled to qualified immunity because detaining a witness uh, after a police shooting is not something that was it's clearly established that you can't do that. What's incredible is that the second opinion makes no substantive reference to the first opinion. Drops one footnote saying, oh, we, we, we discussed the facts of, of this case in an earlier opinion, but it doesn't talk about the fact that it reached a completely different conclusion on the basis of very similar conduct and makes no effort to reconcile the two cases. I, on one level, I find that mind-boggling. On the other level, I find it perfectly consistent with how courts approach qualified immunity cases, which is essentially find a way for the officers to win whatever it takes and work backwards from there. And I think that is, frankly, a fair dis- uh, description uh, of, the, of the Turner case that we've been discussing. Okay, well, let's move on to the next case, Clark, which also comes out of the Fifth Circuit. So this case involves less tragic circumstances than the ones we've discussed before. Um, Nobody got killed. But it's absolutely jaw-dropping what happened in this case. And I can tell you very briefly, essentially a woman is um, arrested pursuant to a drug warrant. She's uh, taken to uh, a—this is in Mississippi. She's taken to a local jail. And she sits there for 96 days without any kind of a hearing or an arraignment. Why? Because there's a, the, the court is not in session for three months. There's just apparently no judge available to come and, and uh, arraign her and set bail or do any of these other things. Oh, and by the way, it turns out that once, once she finally does get some due process, she turns out to be innocent of these charges. She sits in jail for three months without any kind of judicial intervention um, and uh, then sues the sheriff and the county that were responsible for this. And their argument is essentially, hey— There's nothing on the books that says you can't throw an innocent person in jail and keep them for three months without giving them access to a judge. So must be good. Or at least we're not. We certainly can't be held liable for it because there is no case on point saying that you can't hold a woman named Jessica Jouch, which is apparently her name, in a county prison for 96 days without any uh, access to a judge. There's no case that says exactly that. So we get qualified immunity. And the district court agrees. And what does the Fifth Circuit say, Sheldon? The Fifth Circuit in, you know, one of these rare examples of a court finding uh, that there is no qualified immunity says we don't buy it. Come on. This is ridiculous. Uh, Every reasonable police officer would know that you can't hold someone in basically indefinitely in jail without access to a, a hearing, uh, access to a judge. And uh, and so she's able to proceed with her claim. And it's a completely different outcome than you get in most cases. Yeah. And I have to say one of the things I, I you know what, the the defendants in this case, they're right. There is no case that is clearly on point that says that you can't let somebody rot in jail for three months without access to a judge. The court really kind of has to cobble that together. And you know that they're kind of doing something a little off the books when they go all the way back to old timey England and they're citing decisions and commentators from England. Um, That's sort of the dead giveaway that there isn't actually uh, a Fifth Circuit case directly on point. Um, So in a weird way, I think the defendants are right in that they were probably entitled to qualified immunity under um, the existing doctrine, which requires a, a case clearly on point. But I think that doctrine itself is bankrupt. And so it's uh, in a weird way, the court got the right result probably in this case, but it did so largely by ignoring um, the the what qualified immunity has become, which is in essence a get off the hook uh, free doctrine for law enforcement. So not sure if it's a right result or not, but it's certainly a just result. You know, uh, one of the interesting things about qualified immunity, and we've talked about this, Clark, Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the episode that uh, qualified immunity was invented out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court. And uh, I think there's there's a growing recognition among a lot of folks, including judges, that this is actually the case. Uh, there's a, a really interesting uh, law review article by 
a Chicago law professor, Will Bode, uh, that talks a little bit about this. Former IJ clerk. And, Former IJ clerk. And Chief right. Justice Roberts clerk. Yep. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the paper that uh, Will has written and what it means, uh, what, what it ought to mean for judges who are kind of trying to sort out these qualified immunity cases? Sure. So the gist of qualified immunity doctrine is that, um, again, you have a federal civil rights statute that uh, gives people a right to sue um, people acting under color of law for violating their their constitutional or other rights. There is nothing in the text of that statute about immunity um, for police officers, for prosecutors, or for anybody else. So uh, over, you know, in a series of cases, the Supreme Court has engrafted uh, onto the text of this statute various immunity doctrines, qualified immunity for police, absolute immunity for prosecutors, um, uh, it has eliminated the doctrine of respondeat superior, meaning that the employer is liable for the actions of the employees. Just a, a whole bunch of government favored, favoring doctrines that the Supreme Court has invented and engrafted onto the text of 42 uh, section 1983. What Will Bode does in his article is he challenges the originalist uh, credibility of of qualified immunity and, and, I, and essentially challenges each of three um, originalist bases that the Supreme Court has identified for essentially why it's reasonable to infer that Congress intended to incorporate qualified immunity into the text of Section 1983, and he systematically demolishes each and every one of those rationales and, sh and lays bare the fact that this is nothing more than an act of judicial policymaking, one branch, Article Three, reaching out to help its friends in another branch, Article One, to help state actors get off the hook when they violate people's rights. And I want to say that uh, Cato is going to uh, launch a campaign uh, to repeal and eliminate qualified immunity, whether judicially or legislatively. There is absolutely no basis for the Supreme Court's decision to vastly constrict the language of Section 1983 and the cases that have built upon that initial uh, uh, act of judicial activism. This is actually one of the few times you can use that charge. This was absolutely an act of judicial policymaking. Um, subsequent cases that have narrowed that doctrine, or I should say that, that have narrowed um, the um, ability of a plaintiff to get relief under Section 1983 are completely indefensible and, and really just on the books in order to help government. And uh, so we're hoping that the Supreme Court will, in fact, take a fresh look at this. And we're hoping that lower courts, we're going to file amicus briefs in lower courts uh, uh, invoking Will Bode's article and essentially try to get lower courts in cases that are close calls to recognize that if you're on the fence about whether to apply qualified immunity based on the facts of the case, you might want to also consider the fact that it is a completely illegitimate doctrine that was invented out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court and doesn't have a shred of originalist support or credibility. Just might want to keep that in mind. Uh, I, I love that uh, idea, and, and I hope that it uh, it does uh, really kind of infiltrate not just uh, the academy, where I think that Will Will's papers garnered a lot of attention, but the people who are doing the actual judging. Yeah, and I want to add one other thing. Um, there's a real accountability issue here, too. I'm talking about political accountability. If a legislative branch wants to adopt a a legal doctrine that says that police officers can do the kinds of things we've been discussing in this podcast, can hurt people in the ways they've hurt them, can show the kind of callous disregard uh, for people, you know, when they've just shot their father in a SWAT raid or people they've thrown in a county jail with no access to a judge for three months. If Congress wants to say that the, the people who engage in that conduct should be let off the hook, Congress should say so. And then it should take the political hit that comes when people say, hey, this is not a good policy. We shouldn't be letting police officers off the hook who engage in this kind of conduct. Right here, there's no accountability because what you've got is the Supreme Court imputing to Congress an intent to let these police officers off the hook, um, even though Congress never explicitly said so. That is an absolute short-circuiting, to coin a term, of the political process. And uh, that's, that alone would be a good reason for eliminating qualified immunity. Okay, that concludes the show. Clark, it was great to have you back. For more judicial engagement, be sure to follow Sheldon and Clark on Twitter. Their handles are at Sheldon Gilbert and at Conlaw Warrior. Until next time, this is John Ross from the Institute for Justice, sweet-talking you to get engaged. Mm -hmm.